that standing ovation would mean a lot more if I know you, you didn't rehearse it. <laughs> you know, lesson number one in entrepreneurship, don't be proud, man. Take it when they offer it. Um, a little bit about my background. Uh, you heard uh, one version. Um, I have to say, I have not seen the Steve Jobs movie yet. So uh, people have told me that I mentioned, so at some point I will see it. Um, you know, when you live through the situation, it's not clear that you want to revisit it necessarily. <laughs> so I have not yet seen it, and um, there was no actor. My name was just mentioned, I think, a couple times. Um, I was hoping that maybe Jackie Chan would play me, but <laughs> you know, life is full of disappointments. Um, I, I have uh, been a, a Macintosh evangelist from 1983 to 1987 for Apple, the Macintosh division. Uh, this is when I worked for Steve. And I left, I started some software companies, I returned to Apple as Apple's chief evangelist and an Apple fellow. And then I left and I started uh, Garage.com, which was a venture capital investment bank. And subsequently, I, I became a writer and a speaker. Today, I'm chief evangelist of Canva. Uh, I gave you a Canva promo card so you can try our service for free. Although much of the service is free anyway, so you don't really need that promo card. Canva is an online graphics design service. So think fast, free, easy to use version of Photoshop. Um, I can tell you that we can build a graphic for you faster than you can boot Photoshop. So, so that's what I am. And so today I'm Chief Evangelist of Canva. I'm an Executive Fellow at the Haas School of Business at UC Berkeley. I am, yeah, I am a, well, I am a Board of Trustee member of Wikimedia. Wikimedia is the parent organization of Wikipedia. Uh, and I'm also a Mercedes brand ambassador, which is a whole other story. Somebody's got to do it. Uh, <laughs> so uh, life is pretty good. So I, uh, I live like four miles from here, and I want to help you in the next half hour as much as I can as entrepreneurs. Uh, it is true that I'm going to play ice hockey right after this. Uh, I know that many of you uh, want to pitch me on your company where you're going to sell dog food online. And I, I know I should stay and spend an hour with you talking about how to sell dog food online. But I'm 61 years old. I figure i got 20 years left in me of playing ice hockey. So every day counts. Okay? <laughs> so so I, I have been watching uh, high-tech speakers for about 30 years, believe it or not. Probably longer than many of you have been alive. And I noticed two things about high-tech speakers. First of all, and I hope you don't notice this at this conference, but most high-tech speakers suck. And also, most high-tech speakers go long. And that's a deadly combination, you know? Like if you suck and your speech is short, it's okay. And if you're great and your speech is long, it's okay. But if you suck and go long, that's like being stupid and arrogant. I mean, it's just, you know. So um, what I have done in my career is I've always uh, adopted the top 10 format. So I'm going to give you the top 10 mistakes of entrepreneurs that I've noticed, that I've tried to help prevent, and also that I made. Okay, so, you know, when you're a keynote speaker, there's often the temptation to talk as if you did everything right in your career. So just listen to me, follow my example, and, and that's total bullshit. Um, I made a lot of mistakes. So I'm trying to prevent you from making the same mistakes. At least make new mistakes. Okay? I mean, Give yourself that much. So these are the top 10 mistakes that I've noticed of entrepreneurs, including myself, and uh, how I think you can prevent the mistakes, okay? Uh, Steve Blank, who follows me, knows more than I do. Tim Draper also knows more than I do, but I get to be opening speech. They gotta follow me tough, okay? So, so top 10 mistakes of entrepreneurs. So mistake number one is this great temptation to multiply a big number by 1%. So the way this works, let me give you the typical Silicon Valley pitch. 300 million Americans, one in four owns a dog, 75 million own dogs in America. Each dog eats two cans of dog food per day. Total addressable market of 150 million cans of dog food per day times 1%. Patent pending, curb jumping, paradigm shifting, innovative way of selling dog food online, made with my rock star programmers that I met drunk one week at a frat. <laughs> and so, how hard could it be to get 1% of 150 million cans of dog food per day? That's 1.5 million cans of dog food per day times 365 because dogs eat every day. This is not B2B, this is B2C, or B2D more accurately. <laughs> so, so, 
1%, in mere 1%, conservatively speaking, worst case, 1% of 150 million cans of dog food per day, one and a half million cans of dog food per day, conservatively speaking. I hear plans along these lines every day. I bet many of you have said this, right? Six billion people in China, how hard could it be to just get 1% of that? Do you realize how big we'll be if we just get 1% of the people in China? How hard could that be? Huge mistake, because it is hard to get 1%. There's two mistakes in this. It's hard to get 1%, believe it or not. And also, I don't think any potential investor wants to hear that the focus of your company is to get a mere 1%. Two sort of contradictory problems with that. So I think that the solution is to always calculate from the bottom up. You should always do a bottom up analysis. So the bottom up analysis on selling dog food online would be, well, let's see, we'll open up a website using our black hat, you know, SEO tricks where we're gonna stuff all the keywords in the headers and we're gonna search for the terms that people use and we're gonna hide out behind Matt Cutts' house and go to Google and go through the dumpster and we're gonna figure out the algorithm because we're smarter than the 25,000 PhDs at Google. Let's say you get 100,000 unique visitors a month, you know, in the first part of your company to visit your website. Of those 100,000 uniques, a mere 1% buys a case of dog food. So that's 1,000 people buying a case of dog food. That's 20,000 20, cans of dog food per month. So bottom up, you're at 20,000. Top down, you're at 1.5 million. Hmm. Guess which way? you probably are going to go initially. You're gonna be much closer to 20,000 than one and a half million. So always do this bottom up calculation, okay? It's a reality check. Mistake number two is that you scale too fast. The way the thinking goes like this is, investors gave us money to invest, not to sit on it, not to conserve it, to invest. They want us to spend because we have swap spit, because we have kumbaya, we have seen eye to eye. Our investors love us, they believe in us. So we need to scale, because using our patent pending curve jumping paradigm shifting way to sell dog food online, conservatively speaking, we're gonna sell a million and a half cans of dog food per day. And the worst thing in the world would be to have a bad reputation for service. So we need to have several locations. We need distribution sites across the world. We need to co-locate our IT infrastructure. We need to build customer service. We need to build onboarding procedures because we're going to ship on time, bug free, and people are going to come and buy dog food the moment we open up our site. So let's build all this infrastructure up because the worst thing in the world would be to start off with a poor service reputation. Well, guess what? Your rock star programmers are not rock stars. They don't ship on time. What a concept. First time in history a company missed its initial shipping date. They don't ship on time. And guess what? To extend the metaphor a bit too far, the dogs do not eat the food. You thought you'd sell a million and a half cans of dog food per day. You're not even close to that. But meanwhile, you have these three co-locations. You have 150 and 50 people in customer service ready to handle the one and a half million cans of dog food orders per day. But it doesn't happen. So you scale too fast. You build up all this infrastructure. And I think this is probably the most common things that kills company. I have never seen a company die because it could not scale fast enough. Once in my life, once in my career, I hope I can invest in a company or advise in a company that could not scale too fast. That's what we call in Silicon Valley a high quality problem. Okay? The solution is a very different perspective, which is to always eat what you kill. That is, you don't build up an infrastructure, you don't hire customer service, you don't do all those things until you are actually got something killed, until you've bagged it. Not because you're going to bag it, not because you believe in yourself, not because you think you're going to bag it, it's after you bag it. Now, this may lead to some interruptions in support, right? But I'll tell you something, as long as you have a great product or service, people will put up with a lack of great service and support. It's much more likely you're going to die from scaling too fast than you're going to die because of a poor reputation for service, okay? Eat what you kill. Number three is to focus on partnerships. 
We have partnerships with all these large companies. We have partnerships with all these infrastructure people. We have partnerships with incubators. We have all these grand partnerships. You know what? Partnership is a bullshit word. <laughs> Let me tell you what partnership means. Partnership means I don't have sales. That's what a parsis do. So you think, you know, you're blowing smoke and you're convincing people that you're on the track for success because you have all these partnerships, okay? And I'll tell you something, it just doesn't ring true. The, the only kind, I'll give you a very good acid test for partnership. If you have a partnership and it forces you to open up Excel and change your spreadsheet, change it because sales is going to go higher, change it because costs are going to go lower, some aspect of this partnership forces you to change Excel, okay, okay, I can believe in that partnership. But most partnerships is merely an exercise in PR. Let us blow smoke. Let's say we have a partnership with Microsoft, partnership with Amazon, partnership with IBM, partnership with HP. Partnerships are bullshit most of the time. Second thing, the way you prevent this is focus on sales. So what I'm trying to tell you, and people violently disagree with this, Steve Blank may disagree with it, Tim Draper may disagree with it, but I think sales fixes everything. Really. If I could just communicate one thing to you, just forget everything else I tell you today. Sales fixes everything. Because as long as you have sales, and you have revenue, and you have cash flow, you are still in the game. If you don't have sales, all the partnerships, all the bullshit, all the business development, all the strategic stuff is total bullshit. Sales fixes everything. When you have sales, your investors leave you alone. Okay? When you have sales, people are happy. You don't need to have sand volleyball. You don't have to have free sushi and back rubs and all that. <laughs> sales fixes everything. And there's, there's often this discussion of, well, you know, what came first? Was it passion for my business or sales? And most people say, well, people are passionate. And that leads to great product, which leads to sales. I think you could build a case it's the opposite. Like, let's say you don't really care about selling dog food online. You hate dogs, right? You're a cat person. You hate dogs. Or maybe you can't stand the thought of killing cows and putting them in cans for dogs, okay? Somehow you hate dog food. But my God, you stepped into this startup and it literally is selling one and a half million cans of dog food per day. Okay, let's just make up this story. Guess what? I promise you, you will develop a passion for dog food. <laughs> You will say, we are democratizing dog food. <laughs> it used to be such an inefficient supply chain. You know, there was the, the cow, the slaughterhouse, the canner, the factory, the pet store, the dog. And we're going to disintermediate all that in, in, insufficient, all that duplication of function. We're going to eliminate that. We're going to make dog food so much more efficient. I feel passionate about dog food. We're bringing joy to dog food owners around the world. Focus on sales. Sales fixes everything. Fourth mistake is to focus on the pitch. Uh, I meet many entrepreneurs, particularly first-time entrepreneurs, they're so obsessed with the pitch and the plan, you know, that they think the most important application for a startup is PowerPoint. Second most important is Excel. Third most important is Word, because we need to write the business plan, we need to make the forecast, and we need to make the pitch. It is as if the mission of your company, the reason that your company exists, is to raise money. Okay? The reason for your company is not to raise money. Raising money is a means to an end. The end is to create customers. That's what you want to do. So I see many, many entrepreneurs who focus too much on the pitch. Excel. Word and PowerPoint are not the key apps for you. What you should do is focus on the prototype. Make that prototype website, make that prototype software, make that prototype hardware, the device, you know. Very few people are funding the, pe the process of making pitches on Kickstarter, right? Have you ever seen a Kickstarter project? Support our creation of our PowerPoint. Click here. Right? If you donate a hundred dollars, we'll put your name in the PowerPoint. If you donate fifty dollars, we'll send you a PDF of the PowerPoint. Right? 
Focus on a prototype. The most important thing you can do is focus on a prototype. Get the prototype out. You'll learn more from shipping a prototype than pitching a thousand venture capitalists. A very good, um, a very good calculation to keep in your mind is that when it comes to PowerPoint and pitches, you know, I think a, a picture is worth a thousand slides, right? But a prototype and a demo is worth a thousand pitches. <laughs> prototype. Prototype is everything. Number five. Number five is if we're going to do a pitch, let's at least do the pitch right. I think most pitches contain way too many slides. And audience after audience hears me say this. This is the Guy Kawasaki 10, 20, 30 rule of PowerPoint, which is the optimal number of slides in a PowerPoint presentation is 10. 10. You'd be lucky to get 10 points across. You should be able to give these 10 points in 20 minutes. Why 20 minutes when the meeting is 60 minutes? It's because, unfortunately, to this day, roughly 90% of this world still uses Windows. And I know when you show up for a pitch with a Windows laptop, you need 40 minutes to make it work with the projector. <laughs> refers to the optimal font size. A very good test for you is figure out who the oldest person is in the audience, divide his or her age by two. Pitching a 60-year-old VC, 30 points. 50-year-old VC, 25 points. God help you, someday you may be pitching a 16-year-old VC, eight points. <laughs> 10, 20, 30 rule. 10, 20, 30 rule. You know, the way the ideal pitch goes is that you, in the first minute, Explain what you do, not who you are, what you do. I think many people, uh, and it's probably going to happen at this conference, you know, somebody's going to ask Tim Draper, so Tim, what do you look for in a company? And Tim's going to say, people, we want a team, we want a world-class team. So you hear that, and you're going to say, okay, so we should start our pitch with an explanation of the team, okay? So you're going to say, well, my ancestors came across in the Mayflower, they landed <laughs> in Connecticut, they started this Connecticut blacksmith. And then they turned that into a store. And then eventually, you know, my father became the biggest, um, biggest entrepreneur of stores in all the Northeast. So he, he endowed a chair and bought a building at Dartmouth. So I went to Dartmouth. And after Dartmouth, I went to Harvard Business School. And after Harvard Business School, I went to Goldman Sachs. And after Goldman Sachs, I got bitten by the tech bugs. So I came to Silicon Valley and I started working for Google. And then I took .NET classes at Microsoft on the weekend. And so now here I am. And you know what? Nobody gives a shit. <laughs> nobody, nobody gives a shit. A much better story is my parents came over in the last helicopter out of South Vietnam. They landed in Sacramento. They ran a liquor store. They saved every penny they could to send me to Sacramento State. I went to Sacramento State. I took computer science. I love computer science. And I'm here today. I started this company in my dorm. We eat nothing but noodles every night. Okay? We haven't had protein for years. But we <laughs> But we built this great website, and now 10,000 people are signing up per day. We need capital to expand. Oh my God. Oh my God. Be still my heart. I want to hear that story, right? And so, don't start your pitch with who you are. Because almost by definition, if you're pitching, you need money. And if you need money, it's because you're not been successful so far, or you're not proven. <laughs> Duh. So you're trying to build this place, you have a world-class team by dropping Dartmouth, Goldman Sachs, right? You work for J.P. Morgan, right? You, you saw the big short, you know, all about finance, right? So, you know, I think in the first minute, you have to explain what the hell you do. I've sat in so many pitches. 15 minutes into the pitch, I know this guy came over in the Mayflower, right? I know this guy came over from this. I know this guy's history. I know they're third generation. They've been out chairs at Harvard and Stanford and Dartmouth. I still don't know what they do. I don't know if it's software, hardware, device, 3D printing. I have no idea what to do. And I'm sitting there wondering, what the hell does this people do? You need to answer that question. I'll give you another metaphor. Two kinds of airplanes in the world. Airbus 380, 787, 747. Those things need two miles of runway to take off, okay? Other kind of airplane, F-18, takes off from a U.S. aircraft carrier, okay? It goes zero to 150 knots in one and a half seconds. There's a steam catapult. You strap your thing in, your butt into that plane, and boom, you are in the air or you're dead. There's only two choices, right? So I think when you make your pitch, don't do a 747. A 747 is rumbling along 
And at 1.9 miles, it lifts up, and everybody goes, huh, we defined gravity again. <laughs> 747 pitches, let me tell you about my team, because I heard Tim Draper say he invests in teams. So we're going to go through all five people on our exec staff and tell you their background. That's a freaking 747. You want an F-18. This is what we do. We have democratized design. So now, people don't need to buy Photoshop or an expensive high-end product. They, need, they don't need to rent it. They don't need to spend weeks learning it. You go to Canva.com and you'll be instantly creative and productive with graphics. That's it. F-18, not 747. Number six. Number six is, I think many entrepreneurs believe that it's a serial world. First I'll raise money, then I'll hire the team, then I'll build a prototype, then I'll get sales, then I'll go public. Okay? And I thought this way too, but life is not fair. Life is not serial. Life is parallel. I need to build the prototype, recruit the team, raise money, sell and support at the same time. We're pushing everything down the path at the same time. Admittedly, it would be easier, maybe even more optimal, to do things serial. If I could just focus on fundraising, focus on the prototype, focus on sales. Life is a bitch, okay? Life is parallel. It is not serial for an entrepreneur. Number seven. Number seven is the concept that you are going to retain control. Okay? So retaining control is a delusion. I know, I know you have advanced math degrees and you know that 51% is the majority of the company. So you think that with you and your buddies having 51% of the company, you control the company. Okay? Because you think that in board meetings, when push comes to shove, there's going to be a vote. Right? And the vote's going to be 51, 49, and you won. I've never seen that happen. Just about every board meeting, every decision is unanimous. It never comes down to vote for strategic direction, vote for how we should do this, vote for who we should hire. So the concept of retaining control once you take outside money is an illusion. You cannot retain control. You have to understand that the moment you take outside money, you take somebody else's money, you have obligated yourself to make that person more money. They're not investing in you because they like you, because they're your friend. They want to give you a dollar and get 50 back. That's it. You are a tool. Okay? You are a means to an end. So understand that. And control is overrated. Because if you had a very large percentage of a company that fails, it doesn't mean anything. Ideally, what you want is a small percentage of a hugely successful company. It is much better to own 0.5% of Google than 51% of a piece of crap. Okay? So give up this concept that we have to retain control. Because the moment that you have taken outside money, you have lost control. Just get over that. And so the better way to approach this is to think we need to make a bigger pie. Instead of 51% of a piece of crap, we want to end up with 5% of the next Google, Cisco, Apple. Always be thinking bigger pie, bigger pie. It's not the percentage of the company that you own. It's the per share price. That's what you care about. Per share price. Number eight. Number eight is to use patents for defensibility. Right? I bet in many of your pitches, when it comes to the defensibility slide or the competitive analysis slide, you say we filed patents. Okay? So I'm not discouraging you from filing patents. Go ahead, God bless you. File a patent, cost 1500 bucks, right? And it'll take you 10 years to get it done. By then you'll probably be dead, but it's okay. <laughs> file a patent, if nothing else, it will impress your parents. Seriously. Like, Mom, I have a patent in my name. That's like, you know, if for an Asian American, if you're not a doctor, lawyer, or dentist, but you hold a patent, that's as good as it gets. <laughs> so, I think, you know, the, the ideal number of times you use the word patent in a pitch in explaining your company is one. So on some slide about competitive analysis, you're meeting with Tim Draper, just say, we filed all the patents we could, but, and here's where the IQ test happens, but we do not believe that patents make us defensible. Because 
It'll take so long to get it. So expensive. And then if somebody violates our patent, we would have to go to court. So let's see. We have Apple, Microsoft, Google, Cisco. They have infinite money. We have limited money, but we're going to win the patent lawsuit. Like, what planet are you on? <laughs> now, people say, well, God, every once in a while you read this story. $60 million settlement, Microsoft versus some file compression company. Microsoft was found to violate the patent of file compression co, right? So, God, that proves that it works. It doesn't prove anything. The fact that you heard about this story is because it hardly ever happens. So when it does happen, it's news, okay? Patents, I hope there are not too many lawyers here. File the freaking patent, okay? But don't believe in your mind. It makes you defensible, and never say that it makes you defensible. The exception to this may be biotech, but generally speaking, don't say that patents make you defensible. What you should say is, we filed the patents, we're going to do this just in case, someday we may be acquired, it'll make us more valuable. But fundamentally, we believe that what will make us defensible is our success. So we are focusing on making our company successful. That's what you do. Okay? There are many companies who cannot patent their idea. Not patentable. Or patentable, but not defensible. The key is to succeed. Scale makes you defensible. As I said before, sales fixes everything. Number nine. Number nine is that when you hire people, you hire people in your own image. Right? So if you're male and white, you hire male and white. If you're young, you hire young. I think it's a huge mistake that to, to really be successful, you need to hire people who complement you, who are different from you. If you're a kid, you need an adult, right? If you're a man, you need a woman. You need more women, because you have to over, it takes two women to overcome the stupidity of one man. So, so, But I see so many companies that it's like, you know, Stepford, and like everybody is the same. So you need to hire people who compliment you. If, you know, fundamentally in a company, there's only two real functions, okay? When you cut all the bullshit out, there's only two things the company has to do. You have to make it and you have to sell it. Duh! Everything else is bullshit. If you have somebody who can make it, somebody can sell it, you got it. So if you hire only engineers, like yourself, there's going to be no way to sell it. And if you hire MBAs who are good at selling, there's nothing to make. There's nobody, you know, nobody's making something to sell. So you need to compliment, right? Hire people who are different from you. Number 10. Number 10 is this concept that you're going to befriend your investors. Because you met with them, and they really understand what you're doing. They really like you. They said to you, we invest in people. <laughs> we have faith in you. We have confidence in you. Why do you think we're giving you millions of dollars? It's because we invest in people. And what you hear is, oh, they like us. <laughs> they befriended us. We're going to go play golf together at the Los Altos Country Club. Right? <laughs> and listen, I'm not saying you should have a hostile relationship with your investors. But I'm telling you that that is a very tenuous relationship. I don't want to sound negative and depressing and all that, but just accept the role that you are a means to an end. They want to give you a dollar and get back 50. That's okay. They're not going to say it in those terms. They're going to say that they trust you, they love you, they see you, they get the vision and all that. But I think whenever you hear somebody say, we like you, we trust you, we're investing in you. Just add one more phrase to that sentence. Every time you hear somebody say that, just add one more phrase, which is, as long as things are going good. <laughs> we like you, as long as things are going good. We believe in you, as long as things are going good. Just hear that. And so the better approach to this is to always exceed expectations. Right, so I, I guess I'm telling you, you should sandbag investors. You should always sort of forecast what you are 80% certain you can deliver. That you should tell them that something's going to ship in June and it ships in May. 
And as long as you exceed expectations, it'll be a friendly, cordial relationship, or they'll leave you alone, which may be better. But always, always, you know, understand that this is a financial transaction. It's not about kumbaya, swapping spirit. We're not, we're not swapping spit. You know, I'll give you a, an online dating analogy, okay? So in online dating, there are two extremes. It's eHarmony. In eHarmony, you're going to find your soulmate. You're going to walk hands in hands on windswept beaches, drinking white wine, completing each other's sentences. Your kids are perfect. There's no ADHD. There's no Asperger's. They've got straight A's. They're trying to pick between Dartmouth, Harvard, Stanford, 4.2 GPA, 2400 SAT. Right? Your house is clean. Your dogs are well trained. They don't poop in the house. Life is good with eHarmony. 29 feels of psychographic information. Are you funny? Are you outgoing? You're like white wine or red wine. You find your soulmate, right? That's eHarmony. And the other side of online dating is Tinder. <laughs> interesting, not interesting, interesting, not interesting. I hate to tell you, but in entrepreneurship, it is a Tinder world. It's a Tinder world. It ain't eHarmony. It's Tinder, okay? So in this Tinder world, exceed expectations, don't meet expectations. Exceed expectations, don't meet expectations. That's the world we live in. Now, I don't want you to think I'm filled with anger. I think somebody should tell it to you straight. So maybe I'm wrong, okay? Maybe I'm too negative, but maybe I'm right. And so I'm just asking you that, you know, as you go through your entrepreneurial careers, just remember these 10 mistakes. Remember my suggestion for how to fix them. And if it prevents any of you from making any of these mistakes, I've succeeded. That's the top 10 mistakes of entrepreneurs. Thank you very much.